In the depths of a secluded woodland near West Calder, on the outskirts of Glasgow, the chilling discovery of human remains in a shallow grave on the 17th of December 2015 marked a significant moment. The initial examination revealed a grim scene, fragments of a spine and skull so dismembered, authorities were at first uncertain they were human. This discovery, however, unfolded into a significant breakthrough as the remains were identified as those of Martin Hamilton, a name that had topped Scotland's most wanted list. The suspicion arose that Hamilton had met a violent demise, potentially as far back as April of the previous year, well before his remains were found. The narrative of Martin Hamilton, notoriously known as the Black Hill Butcher, and once deemed Scotland's most despised criminal, culminated in this gruesome end. Having carved a fearsome reputation as a brutal enforcer within the gangland circles, his life's end posed a poignant question. What had transpired over the preceding two decades to lead to such a dreadful finale? This inquiry delved into the dark journey of a man who had been a formidable presence in Scotland's underworld. Welcome to the Pursuit of Perpetrators channel, where I unravel the veiled tales of cryptic crimes. Martin Hamilton, a name synonymous with fear and ruthlessness, cast a long shadow over Glasgow's underworld and its environs for more than three decades. His moniker, intimately tied to a district in the city's northeast, where he wielded his influence for many years, was a testament to his notorious legacy. Born in the Merry Hill area, Hamilton spent his formative years a stone's throw away, in a dwelling on Holdsworth Street, Anderston. This was notably close to the Cranston Hill Police Station, an ironic twist given his future pursuits. In 1984, Hamilton found himself on the wrong side of the law, resulting in a six-year imprisonment for assault with intent to cause severe injury alongside charges for carrying an offensive weapon. Despite his diminutive stature, standing merely at 5.5 inches with a robust build, Hamilton's demeanor was far from indicative of his fearsome reputation. Being gay, he presented an unassuming figure to many, further distinguished by his rapid-fire manner of speech. Underestimating Martin Hamilton was a grave error many would rue. From his teenage years, Hamilton's presence instilled fear and aversion. His schoolmates went to great lengths to avoid him, demonstrating their dread by evacuating the school bus through the emergency exit if he boarded. The early 1990s brought further notoriety to Hamilton's door, quite literally, with two separate shootings occurring close to his Glasgow residence. The Glasgow Evening Times encapsulated the public sentiment by dubbing him Scotland's most hated man, a title that, much to Hamilton's chagrin, would cling to him throughout his underworld tenure. The year 1992 saw Hamilton, then age 30, and three others stand trial at the High Court in Stirling, facing charges of conspiring to rob a branch of the Dunfermline Building Society at Annie's Lang Cross. The prosecution detailed a plan involving the gang breaking into the building society with a key, armed with knives and an imitation handgun, and then lying in wait for the staff. Their intent, was to coerce the arrival staff into surrendering what was believed to be a sum exceeding £30,000. Their conviction cemented Hamilton's infamy in Scotland's criminal annals. The robbery descended into farce mere moments after it began, with the culprits understanding they had walked into a trap within five to ten minutes of entering the building. The operation's leading detective Riley remarked to the press that it appeared the entire city was in on the stakeout, save for the would-be robbers themselves. Despite his fearsome reputation, Hamilton was not seen as a major player, a Mr. Big, in Glasgow's criminal circles during the 1990s. His enterprises, primarily involving drug dealing and armed robbery, did little to elevate his status amongst the city's underworld, who steered clear of him owing to his unpredictable and mercurial temperament. It was becoming increasingly clear that Hamilton's reign of terror in Glasgow was drawing to a close. Now in his late 30s, Martin Hamilton felt the need for a change of scenery. Following his release from prison for the botched robbery at the Building Society, he found himself under close surveillance by the Glasgow Police Force, his movements heavily monitored. Unrecognised, the small, chubby-faced man behind the wheel of a car cruising through the multi-storey blocks of Westerhales in Edinburgh attracted no attention. Little did the locals know, a notorious figure was about to make their city his new domain. The year was 1998, and at 37, Having burnt bridges with the upper tiers of Glasgow's criminal world, Hamilton was compelled to leave. His departure followed a dramatic fallout with the city's criminal elite, notably after being handed a firearm and an advance payment by the infamous Arthur Thompson. The task was to eliminate rival gangster Paul Ferris. However, in a bold move, Hamilton informed Ferris of the plot and absconded with the cash, undeterred by the potential wrath of the so-called Godfather. Yet, despite his audacity, 
Hamilton harbored a significant vulnerability. Martin Hamilton had a penchant for inflicting pain, a proclivity that often led him to exceed the bounds of brutality. On numerous occasions, exceeding 10, he found himself accused of abducting and torturing individuals. These charges, however, consistently unraveled in court as terrified witnesses either recanted their testimonies or ceased all communication with the police. This pattern of intimidation led to a growing dissatisfaction within Glasgow's criminal underworld. Enlisting Hamilton for a task became a gamble, with doubts over whether he would complete the job or excessively employ violence, thereby drawing unwelcome scrutiny from law enforcement. Faced with diminishing prospects in Glasgow, Hamilton redirected his attention to Edinburgh, eyeing the city's prosperous drug trade. He zeroed in on the western sectors of the city, notably Brumhouse, Westerhales, and Sighthill, areas ripe for exploitation. Upon his arrival, the Lothian and Borders police force admitted to having scant knowledge of Hamilton. However, his reprehensible conduct, particularly a series of brutal assaults on low-level drug dealers indebted to him, swiftly garnered police attention. His actions were so heinous that the force's major crime unit assigned a surveillance team to monitor him continuously, determined to curtail his reign of terror. In their surveillance, authorities uncovered a harrowing system where teenage dealers were provided heroin and ecstasy by Hamilton, only to face brutal consequences for any shortfall in their repayments. Edinburgh's drug scene, starkly different from Glasgow's, was characterised by anonymous traffickers and numerous small-time dealers, lacking the middlemen that dominate Glasgow's network. This environment proved ripe for someone like Hamilton, who thrived on direct involvement and swiftly managed to dominate the drug trade in Edinburgh's western districts alongside his associates. Hamilton's influence wasn't confined to the drug market within Edinburgh's housing estates. His operations expanded into Portobello and Musselburgh, where he and his crew exerted pressure on local publicans, club owners and businessmen. The police pinpointed a pub owner who, under the threat of extortion, conceded he'd prefer to pay the £30,000 demanded than face Hamilton in court. Another establishment owner, Billy Sibbald, engaged more directly, purchasing £100,000 worth of drugs from Hamilton. However, with Hamilton incarcerated in Glen Oak Hall Prison, Sibbald believed the debt nullified. This hope was dashed when, in November 2002, Sibbald disappeared, only for his body to be discovered three months later, in a ditch on Edinburgh's outskirts, fatally shot with a shotgun. This incident highlighted Hamilton's exceptional brutality, marking him as a figure of unparalleled sadism within the criminal underworld, torturing and sodomizing young teenage men who had become drug dealers and were unable to pay their debts was frequently combined with a sexual element. Hamilton was later permitted to serve as a listener for other prisoners while he was incarcerated. A more experienced prisoner offers assistance to a less experienced one. He frequently utilized it as a means of luring them away so he could attack them in the most heinous ways. Hamilton had straightforward methods, yet he was uncompromising. He offered local dealers a deal they couldn't turn down, work with me or risk being violently attacked. Most chose to work with him those that didn't wound up in medical facilities. He then went too far though. A youngster, 18, had gone to Hamilton's Glasgow headquarters to obtain drugs, but he never came back. His 18-year-old girlfriend discovered him unconscious on the floor when she returned to the apartment, because she started yelling, knowing that Hamilton was well known, and he punched her. She hit him with a lamp in retaliation. In a harrowing sequence of events, the couple were forcibly taken to a flat in Glasgow's Anderston district, where they were made to stand in a bathtub, a chilling prelude to what would be an easier cleanup of the aftermath. What ensued was a nightmarish ordeal lasting 10 hours, during which Hamilton barked orders and oversaw as a knife was mercilessly driven through their cheeks. The terror escalated as they were informed of boiling water being prepared, leading to Hamilton unleashing a barrage of shouts and screams before subjecting them to scalding, leaving them permanently disfigured. This episode, though not the most atrocious of Hamilton's career in inflicting torture, marked a significant turning point. The young victim's courage to stand as witnesses in court set the stage for a trial conducted under exceptional measures to protect the identities and safety of the witnesses and jury. Given Hamilton's notoriety in his previous stomping grounds, hosting the trial in any of those cities posed too great a risk. Consequently, a media blackout was enforced and the couple was placed under one of Scotland's most stringent witness protection schemes. The court was presented with the graphic details of the teenager's torture, alongside other barbaric acts orchestrated by Hamilton, including attempts to remove an eye with a spoon, the severing of fingers, and setting victims ablaze. Despite being acquitted of several charges, Hamilton was convicted on the gravest counts. Lord King Arthur handed down a life sentence, 
setting the parole eligibility to a mere nine years. Reflecting on Hamilton's sentencing, a senior detective from Edinburgh remarked on his malevolence, comparing his evil nature to that of notorious child murderer Robert Black. Hamilton had a sinister method of drawing young men into his orbit, offering them drugs before coercing them into dealing on his behalf. Those who failed to deliver were mercilessly abducted and subjected to violent sexual abuse. Detectives, having tracked Hamilton for nearly five months, believed he was setting the stage for a prominent Glasgow crime figure to assume control of Edinburgh's drug market upon his release from prison. Despite the risks he posed, Hamilton was paroled in September 2014 from HMP Shots in North Lanarkshire. However, by the next year, he had vanished, leading authorities to initially suspect he had absconded. His disappearance was noted when he failed to appear at Glasgow Sheriff Court, having breached his parole conditions almost immediately. An arrest warrant was issued in April 2015, and Police Scotland launched a public campaign to locate him, highlighting his extreme danger and advising against public interaction. Further efforts to apprehend him included an appeal on the BBC's Crime Watch programme in October, with the Crime Stoppers charity offering a £2,000 reward for information leading to his capture. As time passed, intelligence suggested Hamilton might have been harmed, and in December 2015, this speculation was confirmed when a dog walker discovered his remains in a secluded woodland near the Five Sisters Business Park in West Lothian, bringing a grim end to the search for the notorious gangster. At the time of Hamilton's murder, speculation abounded regarding the motives behind the act. He had been active in smaller towns such as Blackburn in West Lothian and Harthill in North Lanarkshire, with some believing he was attempting to re-establish his presence in the Edinburgh drug market. Another theory suggested that Hamilton had become a target for Liverpool-based criminals after allegedly defrauding them of £40,000. This situation arose when Hamilton took responsibility for collecting debts from cocaine users whose dealer had been incapacitated in a road accident. Despite being tasked with gathering £40,000, he reportedly failed to remit this sum to his Liverpool connections. This narrative gained some credibility when, in January 2017, James Farrelly, a Liverpool native residing in West Lothian, was apprehended and charged with Hamilton's murder. The accusation against Farrelly detailed that he had executed Hamilton with a gunshot to the head and subsequently inflicted additional injuries using sharp and blunt objects between the 16th of April and the 17th of December 2015. Farrelly, who had acquired the moniker Scouse, faced additional charges, including attempting to obstruct justice by concealing Hamilton's body in a woodland area and engaging in the distribution of hard narcotics. Despite his vehement denials of all charges, Farrelly never saw his day in court. Battling a severe addiction, his life was further marred by a terminal cancer diagnosis, leading to his release from Sorton Prison in Edinburgh in March 2017 due to his deteriorating health condition. The final farewell to Martin Hamilton was postponed by eight months, a direct consequence of the ongoing police inquiry into his death. It wasn't until August 2016 that a brief 20-minute memorial service was conducted at Glasgow's Mary Hill Crematorium, witnessed by merely a small gathering of mourners. The death notice, published a week prior, painted a portrait of Hamilton as a cherished son to his mother Margaret, a devoted brother, a beloved uncle and great-uncle, and a valued friend. To the broader public, however, Hamilton's legacy was markedly distinct, embodying a persona that many would prefer to forget. Please leave your thoughts in the comments below. If you found this investigative rundown enlightening, do hit the like button, share it with your friends, and make sure to subscribe to the Pursuit of Perpetrators channel. Don't forget to give the bell icon a tap too, ensuring you stay updated with each new video I release. Your support means a great deal to me, and I'm eager to reconvene with you tomorrow. Until then, maintain that inquisitive spirit and never cease in your quest for truth.